So why don't you go and get the rolls out? And I'll tell him to piss off. <laughs> Cuddly, crotchety, and past his sell-by date. Possibly. Very much the new man, aren't you? No. Stubborn, stroppy, and losing his marbles. Probably. I'm cracking up here. But as far as Zoe's concerned, he's still the only balding solicitor worth jumping around about. The return of Alec Callender. Truly a man of the 90s. The 1890s. Friday at 8.30 on BBC One. Steve Davis is playing Dan O'Kane in the World Snooker in Sheffield over on BBC Two now. This is BBC One, and the nine o'clock news follows in five minutes, after a party political broadcast now by the Liberal Democrats. Between November 1992 and June 1993, I spent two and a half days every week away from Westminster, away from the House of Commons. I went from East Anglia to the Wye Valley and from Cornwall to the Orkneys. I went to schools and homes and mines and factories. I stayed with teachers and business people, rubbish collectors and social workers, farmers and fishermen, pensioners and town planners, and those who had no jobs at all. And I went not so much to talk as to look and to work and to listen. I came back here to Westminster with a very strange collision of emotions, but a far, far clearer vision of where this country has to go. The first emotion I brought back with me was hope, because the people I'd met were extraordinary people. And the second emotion I felt was anger, because so many of those extraordinary people are close to despair. They know from their own eyes, from their own lives, that something's badly wrong. They were promised leadership, but it never came. They were promised prosperity, but it never happened. They were promised a country to be proud of again. You may accuse this government of many things, and I have, but for me their one unforgivable failure is this. We have in this country's people our greatest natural resource. We're an inventive people with pride, enterprise, and energy. I ask no more of a government than to recognize those skills, encourage those skills, and let them flourish for the good of us all. And that is their failure. Every single policy that the Liberal Democrats are committed to shares the same simple objective, to liberate, to equip, to encourage and empower every single person in this country. For all to realize their own potential. For everybody to be a somebody. Add it all together and what will you find? A vast, irresistible national recovery. Now do you see why we put education at the top of every list we make? Not just preschool education and school education and further education, but all forms of help and training and encouragement at all times for all people throughout their lives and throughout their children's lives. And could we pay for it? Yes, we would pay for it. We've got to pay for it. 
We'd start by declaring war on waste. Last year alone, the inland revenue wrote off 1.7 billion pounds in uncollected tax. 1.7 billion that the country was owed, but never got. You can send a lot of children to nursery school for 1.7 billion pounds. And if there was no other way, we'd ask you to pay for it. An extra one penny of income tax, just for education. There's nothing, I promise you, more important. Things can change for the better. There can be more to life, but you just can't leave it up to them any longer. The Liberal Democrats are the smallest of the three main political parties, the newest of the three main political parties, and the only one that's growing. We're getting more votes in local elections, controlling over 24 billion pounds of local government expenditure, attracting more and more individual members. Why don't you join too, right now, and help bring about the changes we all know we need? If you'd like to join the Liberal Democrats, please telephone now on 071 222 7999. Or you can write to Paddy Ashdown, the Liberal Democrats, 4 Cowley Street, London, SW1P, 3NB. That was a party political broadcast by the Liberal Democrats, and it will be shown again with subtitles on BBC Two at half past ten. Henry, a talented young accordion player, makes her mark and a good friend at a Belfast music festival. Screen two in 25 minutes. On BBC One, QED boards a remarkable train in half an hour, equipped as a hospital and bringing treatment and hope to people in remote parts of India, the Lifeline Express. The nine o'clock news, first on BBC One, with Michael Burke. The West is threatening wider airstrikes against the Serbs. The latest ceasefire around Gorazda has collapsed. At least four more people are reported killed in an attack on a hospital. Dame Vera Lynn has threatened to pull out of the D-Day celebration veterans are calling a frivolous jamboree. And centuries for Atherton and Smith in a record stand in the last test. Good evening. In the next few minutes, President Clinton is expected to give details of a much tougher policy against the Serbs. He's likely to announce a harder diplomatic and military line, including widening the criteria of airstrikes. In Brussels today, NATO ordered its military planners to assess the possibilities of using airstrikes to protect civilians in the so-called safe areas. The UN's declared six of these. They include Sarajevo and the Muslim enclave of Garajda, where 390 people have been killed and 1,100 injured in recent fighting. A ceasefire agreed by the Serbs around Garajda last night collapsed this morning. At least four people are reported to have been killed and more than 20 injured when shells hit a hospital and a block of flats nearby. Once more, the town was under attack. Only the Serbs, the source of these latest pictures from Goddard's Day, had a different account of where the attack was coming from. This Serbian soldier, northeast of the town, had it in his sights. The Serbs claim they're the victims of a Muslim onslaught, but the truth seems to be otherwise. Aid workers in Goddard's Day spoke this afternoon of another Serbian attack. Ten people injured in the local Red Cross centre, four killed and eleven wounded, by shell and rocket fire directly on the hospital. All this on the day of another supposed ceasefire. The casualty figures are eloquent. 345 dead, 1,187 wounded in the three weeks of the Serbian offensive. 43 dead, 112 wounded yesterday. The sense of despair is greatest among relief workers on the ground. Relief workers still active in the field will stop all communications with the outside world for 24 hours. May this silent protest honour all innocent victims of this war. The UN was supposed to ride to the rescue with a mixed task force 141 strong, which gathered this morning at Sarajevo airport. The force was led by French Marines, and the British were to have been an important part of it, but were kept out under Serbian pressure. Serbian forces imposed in Fofor to have a lesser detachment. So the British forces, uh, we were uh, equipped on uh, tracked vehicles. We are not allowed to, uh, to go with us. 
The force included a Norwegian field hospital and surgical team. Like the rest, they knew they would not be going anywhere unless there was a ceasefire, and even if there was one, it could fail. I'm a bit scared. I must admit, I'm, I'm a bit scared. But, uh, well, it's something I have to do, so I'm going. Yet the UN force to save the town got no further than Sarajevo airport at the end of the day. It seemed the Serbian politicians hadn't told their soldiers and the convoy was turned around for technical reasons. Martin Bell, BBC News, Sarajevo. And in the last few moments, President Clinton has had this to say about American policy on Bosnia. I think that all of us should be working toward uh, doing whatever can be done to stop the aggression of the Serbs and to restore a, a diplomatic uh, initiative that will actually work. It, it should be clear to everyone that this issue is not going to be solved ultimately on the battlefield. And the best thing that's happened in, in the months and months was the agreement between the Croatians and the Muslims. Uh, freely entered into dealing with a lot of the very difficult issues between them. And I believe uh, the same thing could be done with the Serbs uh, unless they believe that they can continue through aggression to win the territory. Well, I'm joined now from Brussels by our Europe correspondent, Graham Leach. Uh, what's NATO looking for to make its military operations more effective than they have been so far in Garajda? Well, I think NATO is looking for an outcome whereby it will support the call for airstrikes from the United Nations, but on its terms, and that's still uh, what has to be finalised. I think NATO would want a situation where the United Nations sets the objectives, but it decides upon the modalities. So I think if they do go down this path, uh, the more reticent approach towards the bombing of Bosnian Serb targets would go. Uh, logistics supply lines, ammunition dumps, anything which contributed to the shell uh, would then come into the gunner's sights. Also, I detect that NATO wants to get a foot in the door of the command structure in Sarajevo. The lines of authority have been very confused, and if the alliance is to enter upon this daunting task of protecting six safe areas, I think it will want to say in what goes on on the ground. How are the Russians likely to react, and how important does NATO think it is to keep them on board? This is the most delicate aspect of all, because the Russians have been putting out confusing signals. Mr Yeltsin has uh, disowned the Bosnian Serbs, but there remains uh, hostility in Moscow towards uh, further airstrikes. I think NATO regards this as being very difficult indeed. I think they'll go out of their way to keep the Russians informed on what's going on, and will seek to strengthen rather than undermine this new negotiating front that's uh, emerging, involving the United States, the European Union, uh, the United Nations and Russia and of course this is all bound up with the wider question uh, of NATO's more general relations with Moscow and the place of Russia as a great power in the international order. What sort of time scale are we talking about here? Is this likely to drag on through endless meetings? No, I don't think so, and I think the events in Gorazda today will concentrate the minds here. Uh, they've gone away now to discuss among the military planners how this can be achieved. They will work very quickly. It depends on how speedily they can coordinate all this with the uh, UMPROFOR officials on the ground in Bosnia. I think they're looking for an outcome and final approval by the end of this week. Graham Leach, thanks very much. Dame Vera Lynn, the force's sweetheart of the Second World War, says she won't sing at the D-Day concert in Hyde Park if the veterans decide to boycott it. The Royal British Legion and the Normandy Veterans Association say the government's plans for a family day in the park are frivolous. It was only last week that the Prime Minister and the force's sweetheart, Dame Vera Lynn, launched the government's plans to mark the 50th anniversary of D-Day. Now, Dame Vera says she'll consider pulling out of the main Hyde Park event in London if D-Day veterans, worried it'll not be a fitting memorial to their dead comrades, feel they can't attend. At the moment, uh, they are discussing the content of the concert. I don't know about anything else. The content of the concert with the ex-service men. And if they agree, then it's okay. It will go ahead. And if they don't, well, then there's not much point in doing it without them. D-Day veterans were alarmed by plans for street parties like those during the Queen's Silver Jubilee and a government announcement that Hyde Park would be the scene of a dazzlingly entertaining family day. As we understand it, it's to be in the form of a jamboree. 
and we are not going to be involved in a jamboree over what we consider is a commemorative event and a Thanksgiving event. The government has moved to reassure D-Day veterans. The National Heritage Department insists that no firm decisions have yet been taken on the Hyde Park event. And the Prime Minister told a Labour backbencher yesterday that a distinguished soldier was helping to plan anniversary events. Of course, as the honourable gentleman may or may not know, Field Marshal Lord Bramwell is of course part of the committee discussing and organising events for D-Day. Many old soldiers argue that the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II next year is the right time for celebration. And today, Lord Bramall said he agreed that the Hyde Park event could be postponed until then. If there's a demand for it, that's fine. But it's certainly not central, and I, I think it's much more appropriate actually to have it next year. Those representing the men who survived D-Day and the thousands who died during it have now put forward their own suggestions to ministers on how the Normandy landings should be commemorated. Mike Smart, BBC News. Unemployment has fallen to its lowest level for 20 months. The figures were among a mixture of statistics indicating that the economy is recovering, although it's still fragile. The number registered out of work in March, seasonally adjusted, was just over 2,700,000, down more than 30,000. The rate of growth of earnings in February was 3.5%, slightly up on the previous month, but lower than last year. At Ilford's photographic works near Nutsford in Cheshire, they recently agreed a two-year pay deal. 1.5% this year, maybe 3% next. Gone are the days of the old inflation plus formula. Now it's just whatever the employers say an exporting business can stand. Our major markets for Europe, they're in deep depression. We're now looking for markets in the third world and uh, what's euphemistically called the third world and people in India will not pay the prices that Germany were paying two years ago. We have to be conscious of that. So we have to get our costs down, we have to keep our costs down. The staff were disappointed, especially as overtime has been squeezed by rising productivity and new shift patterns. But at least the cost of living isn't rising like it used to, and there are no better offers next door. In the past you could move from job to job if you weren't happy with, with what one company gave you, you went down the road somewhere else. That doesn't happen today. There is nowhere else down the road to go to. Across the whole economy, earnings growth peaked at ten and a quarter percent in the summer of 1990. And then, as the recession bit, it fell over the next three years to a mere three percent, barely above productivity gains. Now, small rises in overtime and bonuses have edged it back up to three and a half percent. Spending in the high street has in recent years run ahead of the slow rise in earnings. But now a CBI survey suggests that tomorrow's official figures for retail sales in March will show a slowdown as shoppers prepared for this month's higher taxes imposed in the budget. The accelerating fall in unemployment in recent months, now down a quarter of a million from its peak just over a year ago, results from a growth in part-time jobs rather than any tightening in the labour market. There are no signs yet that pay settlements are beginning again to cause inflation. Nor do any stirrings of economic recovery lie behind the Treasury's announcement today of a smaller than planned budget deficit for the financial year just ended. It was mainly exceptional local authority receipts from council house sales that helped to pair £4 billion off the £50 billion deficit announced in the November budget. This is not expected to continue and so creates no scope for extra spending or tax cuts this year. The big picture is still of an economy at best on the threshold of eventual recovery. Output is still barely gaining on recession, high street spending may be slowing, unemployment is only falling because part-timers are sharing jobs, and inflation is at its lowest ebb for nearly 50 years. If the Chancellor ever wished to overrule the Governor of the Bank of England and order a cut in interest rates, he could safely do it now. Peter Jay, BBC News, The Treasury. The Chancellor of the Exchequer said today's statistics were a clear indication that the recovery was well underway, but he's rejected suggestions from some Tory backbenchers that he should now reverse the recent tax increases. Today's better jobs figures shrouded bad news for some. 300 Moulinex workers in Birmingham learned their French-owned plant is to close over problems in updating technology. Bad news for a government claiming the recession is over in a city where the Tories hope for local government election success. And with this month's tax increases worrying Conservative doorstep campaigners, MPs were quick to suggest the better borrowing figures should lead to an early easing of tax burdens. Taxes must be reduced before the next general election. And now we have this overshoot. Something like one quarter of those taxes are probably unnecessary. I want to see that money used 
to ensure that there is no increase in VAT next year. That will help pensioners, it'll help the low paid, and it will be a fair way of using the money. But they and others suggesting there was room for interest rate cuts received little encouragement from a Chancellor more concerned with restoring his party's reputation for fiscal prudence. I have no intention of easing up in the policy that's designed to get the public finances back under control. Every developed country in the Western world is having to do the same thing. I think we and the German government are probably in the forefront of getting things under control rapidly. I want to see the British economy to continue to perform better. Opposition spokesmen who want the focus to remain on tax increases argued the government was still forcing the public to pay for past mistakes and called for more investment in the future. These are still the worst borrowing figures in our history and the tax rises that have had to accompany them are the direct result of government economic mismanagement, high unemployment and low growth over many years. A bit of better news on the economy against the appalling record of the last few years ought to be a signal for the government to work harder and invest in things that we need in order to be competitive in the future like transport and education. Tory economists soon concluded there wasn't any real money for the Chancellor to play with. The borrowing total is still huge and most MPs reckon the prospect of tax reductions this autumn remains remote. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. The Irish Prime Minister Albert Reynolds has called for increased protection for nationalists in Northern Ireland. Mr Reynolds said that loyalists had been responsible for eight out of eleven murders this year. In Belfast, a Catholic in his twenties is critically ill after being shot twice in the head by the loyalist UVF at the shop where he works. Later, the IRA shot and slightly injured a Protestant man near his home in West Belfast. Police in Manchester have identified the body of a headless man which was found before Christmas. His head was discovered later 75 miles away. The man's been identified as Adnan Alsani, a wealthy Kuwaiti banker aged 46 who lives in London, or used to live in London. Scotland Yard are investigating a possible link between his murder and the shooting in London of a Jordanian man who knew him. To, uh, a high position, I'm told, as an Until a few days ago, Greater Manchester Police had had no luck in their attempt at identifying the murdered man. His body was discovered on December the 16th under arches close to Piccadilly Station in Manchester. Shortly afterwards, his head was found in Cannock in Staffordshire. At that stage, police believe the victim was of European descent. The breakthrough came when scientists reconstructed the head and produced a likeness close enough to be identified by a family friend dental records confirmed the suspicion. Greater Manchester Police said that a number of box files were missing from Mr Alsaney's flat in Maida Vale. He was of course a very wealthy man uh, and he dealt quite extensively in the stock market in this country. Um, we have no files at the moment. All the files are missing from the flat which would give an indication as to his dealings. I desperately need to trace those or in fact to identify his broker. Mr Alsaney was last seen at the Britannia Hotel in Grosvenor Square, London on December the 14th. Since living here alone, he'd invested in stocks and shares and mixed with a small circle of friends. Meanwhile, in St Mary's Hospital in Paddington, a Jordanian man and woman are said to be serious but stable after a shooting at the weekend. Scotland Yard say the Jordanian man and Mr Alsaney were known to each other, but at present, there's no sign of a link between the two attacks. Mike Mackay, BBC News. The government's launched a safety campaign that aims to make speeding as socially unacceptable as drink driving. It features a hard-hitting commercial that can only be shown after nine o'clock. It shows that even moderate speeds can kill. Last year, over 3,800 people died on Britain's roads. About 1,000 deaths were due to speeding. Statistically, at any one time, more than half of us are driving too fast, and the government wants to make speeding socially unacceptable. The Stark TV commercial shows a victim's ghost. She's been killed by a driver inside the legal speed limit. You see, she stepped right in front of me over there. He's killed me. Didn't she? What an RTA. She stepped right in front of me. You've taken my I didn't see her coming. Like All right, I wasn't driving. speeding. Do you see? Do you understand? I wasn't speeding. But you were going too fast. If you can't stop in time, you're going too fast, aren't you? Inside the law, but outside good sense. The fact is that most of our accidents happen in urban areas, on quiet residential streets, and on shopping streets. And what we've got to do is to persuade people that it's worth slowing down because you can save life. The publicity is being combined with greater use of technology. 
London radar-controlled speed cameras are being reset to target those wrongly thinking they can safely exceed limits by about 10 miles an hour. And illegal loopholes being closed. Traffic light cameras, which aren't radar-controlled, are being adapted to make speed evidence usable in court. Until now, drivers like this, caught doing 50 while jumping a red light, only face prosecution for disobeying a signal. Now, additional charges could mean a driving ban. But the ultimate sanction could be financial. If insurance companies decide speeding's as bad as drink driving, it could mean a massive increase in premiums. That'll be enough to make anyone slow down. Christopher Wayne, BBC News. The Hoover free flight promotion has cost the company at least £48 million. Pounds. Over 200,000 customers have flown free of charge to America. But the company won't say how many people applied, and many say Hoover didn't provide what it promised. Paul Touvier, the Nazi collaborator, is beginning a life sentence after becoming the first Frenchman to be found guilty of crimes against humanity. He faced charges arising from the killing of seven Jews near Lyon 50 years ago. Touvier, who's now 79, had been in hiding for decades after he sought refuge with friends in the Roman Catholic Church. Thousands of Inkata supporters have gathered in South Africa for their first election rally. Their leader, Chief Butelezi, was given an enthusiastic reception following his decision yesterday that Inkata should take part in the country's first all-race elections next week. In the Zulu capital, Ulundi, the celebrations for Inkata's entry into the election reached a new level of enthusiasm today. Chief Butelezi's refusal to take part had been followed loyally by Inkata, but his followers are a lot happier now, even though their late entry into the campaign must make it hard for Inkata to do well. It will be a miracle, of course, if we do well in the election. But your enthusiasm and your support gives me courage that something mirac miraculous may still happen in spite of the fact that we have started so late. 120 miles away on the Natal coast, it could be England. The seaside towns have names like Margate and Ramsgate. But only five miles inland, despite the splendid countryside, it's a jungle. The village of Mbuchini is split evenly between Inkata and the ANC. Terrible things have been happening here. One evening recently, an ex-policeman was driving home when his truck was ambushed by a group of armed men. They set it alight, and he was lucky to escape. Since retiring from the police, he's taken a job as a security man at a factory. He's also become prominent in Inkata, hence the attack. I've been hearing threats to my life because I was, this, I was on the top of the, uh, the dead list of the ANC. I don't know why. I've been asked, why? Am I, why? What's, what have I done? Nobody said. It's just because we don't like ANC. I said, when did I say I don't like ANC? Why should I say I don't like ANC? Having failed to kill him, the gang attacked his house. His eldest son showed us the room where the gang had taken his mother and shot her dead. Two children were injured. The rest survived, but are still in shock. I've got deep wounds in my heart, which I think it's just one of those indelible wounds. Because I loved my wife. So nobody will ever replace my wife. The Tlamayo family insists they don't want revenge, either for the ambush here or for the killing up on the hill. But it's hard to think that all this violence is just going to stop now. People are very scared here still, like this Inkata supporter. It's very bad because of the opposite. The opposite. It's dangerous to say these things. Yes. The leadership of the ANC and Inkata may have come to an agreement, but here the enmity is as strong as ever. John Simpson, BBC News, Natal. New pictures of marine life filmed on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean have revealed ancient forms of bacteria and other previously unseen species surviving in highly toxic surroundings. Scientists hope that they'll learn how some modern pollution problems could be solved. Mini submarines voyage to the bottom of the sea. Most of the seabed is barren, but two miles down, there are surprises. In the mid-Atlantic, scientists have found a volcanic vent. They call it a black smoker. The water gushing from it is at 350 degrees centigrade, and its black color shows it's full of chemicals and metals that were they discharged onto the land would be highly poisonous. Yet in such a toxic, inhospitable place, 
previously unknown species of shrimps, crabs and fish are thriving. The pictures from this formation have astounded scientists. The animals are unusual because they have bacteria which live inside them which actually make use of this hydrogen sulfide, a chemical which is normally very toxic and which would kill most life that's known elsewhere on the, in the oceans. But in these peculiar vent sites, there are these animals which can actually make use of that H2S. And, um, and so these shrimp probably use their heat sensing blind eye to actually migrate towards these vents, which is where the chemicals are. These pictures, previously unseen, are the clearest yet of the remarkable animals that live near these deep sea volcanic vents. Such creatures are more than a scientific curiosity. Life on the surface couldn't survive exposure to such chemicals. The bacteria these animals feed on help them to tolerate the extreme conditions. Scientists hope that by studying them, they'll be able to devise new ways to treat pollution back on the land. David Whitehouse, BBC News. Everton Football Club have been fined £75,000 for enticing their manager Mike Walker to leave Norwich. Walker left Carrow Road in January and a Premier League inquiry found Everton guilty of indirectly inducing him to move to Goodison Park. Everton were also ordered to pay Norwich £50,000 compensation and costs. England's cricketers have broken records in the Test match today. Both Mike Atherton and Robin Smith scored centuries and together they built the highest partnership by English batsmen in the West Indies. After Monday's momentous events, anything England achieved was likely to seem mundane. The sense of anticlimax heightened by the realisation that the pitch on which Lara had compiled his monumental 375 was so good, West Indies couldn't even get England batsmen out on it. But the run harvesting of Smith and Atherton wasn't entirely without incident. Smith losing his off stump to Walsh, only to be reprieved for the second time in his innings by the umpire's signal of no ball. Atherton typically remained unperturbed at the other end, going to his second century of the series. Then his fortuitous partner partially redeemed his disappointing tour by following him to three figures. Eventually, after the pair had compiled the highest English test partnership in the Caribbean, Smith went for 175, and arguably unluckily too. Sadly for the captain, he then followed for 135 with just one run needed to save the follow-on. They got it, but then disappointingly lost Hick to make it 401 for five. It shouldn't matter though, the match is a near certain draw. Kevin Geary, BBC News. Tonight's main news, the bombardment of Garajda by the Bosnian Serbs has continued. NATO has given a positive response to military action to take, and while we've been on the air, President Clinton uh, has been making some proposals and speaking about new American policies vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Serbs. I'm joined now from Washington by our correspondent Martin Sixsmith. Martin, President Clinton seemed to be emphasising the diplomatic approach uh, in the remarks that we heard him make a few minutes ago, but what is the broad range of his proposals? The proposals he's putting forward are a mix of diplomatic and military measures. Uh, he's uh, proposing a, a tightening of the sanctions against Serbia. He's uh, proposing new efforts to get the negotiations back on track. But the main thrust of the package is a, a, a broadening of the criteria for airstrikes to be used uh, against the Serbian forces, uh, broadening the uh, area to all six of the UN declared uh, safe havens, and uh, no longer making it contingent uh, on revenge attacks for uh, attacks on UN personnel. In other words, uh, the airstrikes could be carried out uh, in retaliation simply for the Serbs uh, conducting attacks against civilians in the safe havens. How does this fit in with what NATO is considering? Well, uh, the Americans are saying they're going to uh, take a strong lead at the uh, NATO Council meeting uh, probably later this week. They're not going to let their allies um, talk them out of these proposals as they did uh, last year when they were first uh, put forward. They recognize that the British and the French may have difficulties over the broadening of airstrikes because they have troops on the ground in Bosnia, uh, but the Americans do expect uh, their proposals to go through at NATO. Isn't he worried about how the Russians will react? He's very worried about that, and in fact the reason that the announcement has been so delayed today is that he's been on the phone for much of the afternoon to Boris Yeltsin in Moscow, uh, trying to uh, persuade the Russians that they should go along with these proposals. The Russians have said they're not in favor of airstrikes, and the Russian ambassador to the UN, Yuli Varantsov, has said that it would inevitably draw the United Nations into the fighting in uh, the former Yugoslavia. So that's uh, a difference of opinion which really does have to be addressed by the Americans. Martin Sixmas, thank you. And from the 9 o'clock news, good night. <laughs>
Good evening. Calls for a national medical study of children with limb abnormalities continued tonight after the government ruled out a link with the sea. The health minister said today that claims of a coastal link between so-called clusters of affected babies were inaccurate. Tiffany May is one of four children from Ryde in the Isle of Wight with similarly malformed left hands. They were the first group to be reported. As news of them spread, others emerged, but the coastal link was a red herring. I think the uh, sad thing really is that the press has latched onto this coastal bias, which is something I, right from the beginning, did not agree with. Certainly I ruled out sea bathing right from the first day. The confirmation leaves parents with few avenues to explore, but they're not happy with the level of government interest. Until a widespread survey is done, I don't think they're going to discover anything. They need, they need to um, count how many children have been born with this problem and study them as a whole group rather than just study small clusters of children. Some parents are expected to lobby Parliament tomorrow to press for more action. Well, speaking on this evening south today, the junior health minister, Tom Sackville, said the government would continue investigating the problem. The, the small area uh, health unit of the Department of Health will be looking to see whether any connection can be found in particular areas where there appear to have been uh, an unrepresentative uh, number of such births. And there, is, uh, there are other studies going on funded by the Medical Research Council into deformity, and I hope we will find an answer. And you can see more on this whole issue in tomorrow night's Southern Eye. It's called Why, Mummy? That's on BBC Two at half past seven. Good evening. If you're a little fed up with the weather, well, take heart. It will improve for the weekend, though it is going to be a pretty slow process and it won't be to everybody's liking. Well, this band of ragged rain across the middle of the country just an hour or so ago is a warm front, so it should have been warmer in the south of England and south of Wales than it was further north. Well, it was just about, but it really wasn't on. In fact, the gaps in the cloud further north show where the best of the sunshine has been. It probably felt a lot better in say, Glasgow, for example, or air. On a larger scale, this is how things pan out. There's all the clouds to the south. This low is slowly deepening and eventually will throw this front completely north and out of the way, and things ought to warm up everywhere. Not quite so easy, of course. Well, there's Thursday lunchtime's chart. Still two fronts and still low pressure really taking over the country. Tonight, that rain will drift a little bit further north. There'll be a lot of uh, cloud around, but weather are breaks, fog in the south of England and frost up in Scotland. The rest of us about five degrees Celsius. We start Thursday with a very wide band of cloud for parts of southern Northern Ireland, southern Scotland, much of northern England and north Wales. Now, the rain will probably be light for most of the time and it will tend to break up. The clouds might even break as well, so some sunshine can be had in one or two places. Further south it looks better. Hopefully we'll have some decent spells of sunshine with holes in the cloud, but equally there'll be a few showers around. Again, there could be anywhere in the afternoon. A very small chance of thunder. I think it is, though, very small. Further north again, and this is the part of Scotland that had quite a nice day today, it'll probably start much the same way tomorrow, but further north from that still, through the Northern Isles, the Western Isles, the Northern Highlands, it's been cold and windy, and yes, there's sleet likely to fall on the hills. That'll try and push its way south into Grampian region during the later part of the day. The temperatures more or less reflect the averages, although it will feel mild in the south and cold in the extreme north of Scotland. On Friday, that warm front's being pushed northwards, so the rain is also going north. Everywhere will feel a little bit warmer, but also there'll be some pretty hefty showers around. On Saturday, we drag the cold front up, we deepen the low, it'll be rather more windy. In fact, the rain will never leave the eastern side of the country, even on Sunday. That's all from me. Good night. The name's Winter. Dylan Winter. The consumer spy. This week, he's going underground armed with a secret camera and a microphone cunningly disguised as an umbrella. His mission, to expose the standards of service on London's tube. Catch Secret Service Friday, 7 o'clock on BBC One. International football involving the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, plus the World Snooker in Sheffield are in sports night beginning in half an hour. We take the Lifeline Express, first on BBC One, the magic train, brainchild of Sir John Wilson, bringing much-needed medicine and surgery to the remotest parts of India, QED. Ms. Miller has never learned to walk.
When she was eight months old, she developed polio, which left her legs partly paralyzed. <laughs> 